us. Because they shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Turn to your neighbor, tell them one more time. Neighbor, neighbor. What, you see what you see is not what you're going to get. Talking about this idea behind beginnings. This idea of establishing and building. Despising these times to which one may be small. I, I don't understand why, I truly don't understand why so many people attempt to convey that they have it all together. Like so many individuals would always try to showcase that they have everything together, they have no issues going on. Or that they've achieved great success, whether it's financially, spiritually, and they've always had it that way. That they're, they're operating at a level of financial freedom, and they're driving their Benz, they're driving the Beamer, and they walk around as if it's always been that way. That they've never seen an ounce of struggle. Yeah. That they've never seen their, their need, their desperation to, 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 to get to the bus stop or their car breaking down. Come on, y'all. Or, or they've never seen themselves in a moment of wanting and desiring. And so they forget where they came from. Yeah. As if where they are currently is more empowering than where they were to get to where they are. They put this facade, this mask, as if they've never struggled. Yet, me personally, I value so much more your story. I value your story. I value that story from when you were going through and how you came out. That, like, like that, those are the things that call and begin to impress any leader, any leader. Yes. Yes. That you have gone through a moment of time to which you had no idea how you were going to come out, but yet you still endured. Yes. Those are the kind of people that I want on my team with work and business. It's not about everything, even in the process of interviewing, as I've done over several hundred interviews over my career, that they're always talking to me about the great things that they've achieved, but I also want to know the times to which you failed and struggled, and then how you got from there to here. Yes. Amen. Diminishing and deminimizing the struggle. The, the, the struggle, that, that, that thing that almost caused you to quit. But I'm such a believer that there is a grace and that there is an anointing that is birth in struggle. Yes, there is. It's so difficult for me to sit and listen to speakers and preachers who have never been through anything. That they talk about the blessings and they talk about the greatness and talk about all these things and, and, and begin to talk about being here, but they themselves have never been here. And so for me, I, can, I tend to disconnect because I'm like, bro, you have no idea what it's like to be. And so there's a disconnect. Y'all with me? Like, like you, you've never then been in a situation to where you had no idea how you were going to get food on your table. And so... There's an anointing that is birth when you are able to go through that struggle and then there's a disconnect for those who are always putting on the facade that you've never struggled. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember um, some of you may know this, others may not, but when I first got into ministry, it was my choice. Um, I was in corporate America at the time. I was doing extremely well. I was making great money, and I can talk numbers because I'm a numbers guy as well. So I'll tell you, I was making about $75,000 a year at that time. Very good money, especially for somebody who was homeless. So several years before that, I was literally homeless, living out of my car. So I know what it's like to secretly, without anyone seeing, go into public bathrooms <clears throat> with a bar of soap and a towel to give myself a shower. 
I know what that level of humility and brokenness is like to wake up every day not knowing what is to take place that day. Not knowing whether or not I'll have enough food to eat. Literally homeless. But over time, I transitioned, I got myself together, and I can go into that story a different time because it's not for the sake of this particular message, but I got myself together, <coughs> and I started doing great things, got into corporate America, started making great money. But even as I was making great money and I was doing these things, there was still a void. Yeah. There was still something that I was missing. So what I was pursuing in one stage, because of course when I was homeless, all I can think about was making some money. Come on, somebody. <laughs> when I was there with no money, I wanted money. Can we be real? Oh, so you're going to leave me out there right now. Like that's all you're thinking about. If you ever been there, all you're thinking about is making some money. I would love to be able to go to the gas tank and actually put gas in my car without having to monitor how much dollars is going. Come on, y'all. Oh, so see, some of y'all never been there before. See, see, there is a privilege, it is a blessing to go ahead and put the gas inside your car, put that little locking mechanism, and let that bad boy ride and just walk away. But some of y'all don't know what it's to be <laughs> like jamming that thing, making sure it's down to the penny. Because you know you only have X, Y, Z in your account or in your hand, and anything over is going to be an embarrassment. So you're just measuring that bad boy and come on. Some of y'all don't know about that. Some of y'all are just living there. You got what they call the first world problems. You got the first world problems. No issues. Have no no idea what it is to struggle to that capacity. But I remember, I was you know making great money. I was feeling this void, and then God began to speak to me regarding ministry. I began to reach out and search out ministers because I understood the importance of a mentor. And so I understood that in order for me to really learn how to minister and get into that vein, I needed some guidance because no one in my family has been a minister or a pastor, right? So I go ahead and seek out an individual and uh, long story short, we build a relationship. He asked me then to come work for him full time. The caveat was he could only pay me $25,000 a year. Yeah. $75,000, I can only pay you $25,000. So this is the dilemma that I found myself in. See, here, I'm doing good, I got money coming in, I'm paying my bills, I'm driving a Mercedes at this time, I have a motorcycle at this time. $25,000 is all I can afford to pay you. See, are you truly willing to pay the price to be great? I personally, voluntarily, voluntarily rejected a $50,000 pay. I, I relinquished $50,000 a year to go and put time into my dream and my passion. I'm not saying for you to do that. This is my story, amen? amen? I'm sharing my story. So I take this $50,000 pay cut after being homeless, making it to this level, but this is where I know I want to be and be pleased and do things unto God. And I take a $50,000 pay cut voluntarily to go and be with this gentleman. And I begin to travel around the world with him, building up his ministry and serving his vision. The crazy thing about that is that during that time, I'd have to say that I made tons of sacrifices to which I know I hurt people in the process. There were times that my entire family would go on a cruise. One, I didn't have the money to join them. But two, I was dedicated to the ministry at that time and I was not going to do certain things. Amen. And so they would go ahead and go on these vacations and I'm hanging back working. Yeah. Mind you, working at a fraction of the price. Amen. Making these sacrifices, all this time and energy into things, 
without seeing the rewards as of yet. Say yet. Yes. Say yet. Yes. Say yet. Yes. There's importance behind yet, and yet it's going to come to fruition in a minute here. And so here I am now making this sacrifice, sacrificing my friends, sacrificing my family, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally and financially struggling. Got rid of my motorcycle. There's no ah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Got rid of my motorcycle. Had to get rid of my beds. And st but thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You, you can relate. You can relate. You can relate. She got she dropped my beds. She dropped my beds. And so and so then there was there was a, a a pressure, a certain pressure that I was under at that time. But long story short, as I'm doing this, I did this for about three and a half years. I was working for this to this day. This uh, ministry is still a great friend of mine. Still a great friend. But I was struggling. And then after about three, three and a half years, that ministry was not uh, prospering the way that they had planned. So, I was then laid off. What do you do when you make the kind of sacrifices for God. For three and a half years, I sacrificed over $50,000 to which I could have been living so much better. But I did this for the sake of ministry and becoming better. Say better. better. I did this and then yet I find myself being laid off after three and a half years. Had no money in the bank. None. So when I go back and I tell you the story about me trying to pump gas in my car, that is not to be funny. Yeah. I know there were times to which I was going to my younger brother. Now mind you, I'm the older brother. There is an emotional breakdown that takes place because my parents always instilled in me to become and be the older brother and be the one providing and helping the younger brother. And here I am going to the younger brother asking him for literally one, two, maybe three dollars in coins. Not asking for a hundred, two hundred. I just wanted a couple of dollars if I didn't have it. Was laid off and was without a job and here I found myself begging for money at a gas station. Because my car had completely run out of gas, I had zero money. I saw a gentleman who drove up on his motorcycle, took out a lot of cash, and as humble as I was, I'm not talking, I wasn't 15, 16, I'm a grown man. And here I am, I was homeless years before, here I am in another predicament again, and I have to ask this person, can I, can I borrow two dollars? And he sucked his teeth at me. And gave me two, two dollars and tossed it at me. That, that is, that is, the story. Yeah. And see, as many people don't and try to hide that they've never had their challenges and their issues, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed of those times. I'm not ashamed to have been homeless. I'm not ashamed to have found myself there literally pleading with the gentleman for $2 to put gas in my tank so I can get home. I'm not ashamed of having to go through toll booths and pausing and looking at the ground to hopefully find a quarter or two. Come on, somebody. Yeah. See, some of y'all can't relate to that. I can appreciate that, but I'm trying to tell you where I've been. Yeah. That was the struggle. That was the tension. That was where I found myself, and yet I'm looking down at my situation. I'm looking up at God, and all I can ask is why. Mm. And then I'm looking to the persons who I was working for, and the other pastors whom he was working, who, had, who they were working for him as well, and there was a, almost a, uh, almost a, a literal disrespect, if you would, because they would not value or understood my value. You understand what I'm saying? So there were other individuals within the ministry who would mock me. Who would mock me and so I'm going somewhere with this can I take my time yes. 
So they would mock me and <clears throat> not understand who I was. And I know I'm not the only person here who has encountered people who did not recognize who they are. That you get around people who don't understand just how powerful you are. That's why I told you to tell your neighbor that what you see is not what you will get. Come on, there is some power in that. What you say to God, say what you see is not what you will get. I was in this place of hurt, of brokenness, and I remember then a prophetic dream to which came to me. I remember the dream so succinctly and so clearly because I was dreaming <clears throat> literally a vision and clearly. When I have a dream and it is from God, I can wake up and I know it's from God. It is clear in my spirit, whether good or bad, warnings or celebrations, I know it's come from God. Amen? Amen? And so I have this vision, this dream, and I wake up. And so what happened was I was falling. <clears throat> I was falling and falling, and I kept going faster and faster as I fell. And then there was a group of people who were just here, almost like floating around. Call it like superheroes almost, right? They're just in the sky, and they're talking. And I am falling, and I pass them, and I'm falling, and they're all laughing. And I keep falling, and here I am falling, and I'm screaming for someone to help me. I'm screaming for someone to help me. And they're looking at me fall, and they're laughing, and no one is lending a hand. And I found myself in such a place of, of isolation at that moment, and so much desperation right there and then. And then as I'm going down and, I, and I'm screaming, all of a sudden there was a man without a face who began to go down with me but was looking at me with no face. It was just an outline. And I'm wondering what and who this was. And then in the vision, in the dream, this person said, you already have everything that you need. So here I am falling, looking to reach for somebody's extension to help me. And then this man without a face literally tells me, you already have everything that you need. Come on, somebody. You already have everything, everything that you need, you already have. And so as I was falling, this is literally what happened as I was falling and the, the man without a face was, was talking to me. I literally then gathered myself within myself and just stopped. I literally stopped the fall in mid-air. And then the man without the face says, now activate. Huh. Now activate. And so right there, I, I just looked at myself within the dream and started to go up and started flying up at a rate that was so rapid. Come on, y'all. That then I began to surpass the very ones who I was trying to reach for. And I was surpassing them at mega speeds. And so what I began to understand when I woke up was that that was the Holy Spirit. Come on, y'all. Talking to me, saying, this you already have everything that you need. Come on, y'all. And so what that tells me then and what began to position me for was to know that when it is my time, it's going to be my time. Yeah. That I already have everything that I need. Come on, y'all. And so when I'm going into this word and this thing is so heavy on me, I need to make sure you understand that the enemy, what he is after is your confidence. Yeah. The enemy is after your confidence. See, he can't necessarily debate or argue that you are serving God. But what he can do is try to confuse you as to why you are serving God. He, he can't debate that you're serving God because I was serving God. But what he was trying to do was to get in my head and challenge me and get me to question why I was serving God. I made these mega sacrifices but yet found myself in a place of desolation. And so naturally, I would then want to just step away and say, you know what, I'm done with God. Yeah. And so that's how the enemy attacks you. So you have to be prepared to know and how to retaliate when the enemy is trying to, 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 to attack you that way. It is, I, I remember during this season, during this time, that my confidence, my self-esteem was, was, was shaky. Like a boy trying to ride a bicycle for the first time. My confidence was always, come on. Like, like I, just, I just didn't know. 
About two weeks ago, I put Maximus on a bike for the very first time to ride his bike. And I'm trying to you know, train him and teach him how to ride the bike, and it was difficult for him. And so he noticed that when he was going down the hill, it was a little easier for him to pedal because he has that momentum. But when he was on a flat surface, it was more difficult. So naturally, my son would then want to get off the bike and walk it up the hill and then get on the bike and then ride it down because it was easier. I also noticed that my wife and Bella were walking and there were times when he was on flat surface and he couldn't pedal that he would want to get off the bike and go follow them because it was easier to walk. It was easier to go down a hill. His confidence was teetering. You get what I'm saying? Like, like your, when your confidence is teetering, you'll do things that are easier, opposed to doing things that are best. You would do things and, 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 and lean on the easy versus holding on to what you need to hold on to, amen? And so when I see that, it reminded me of what took place there. And one of my greatest fears during the time of this, of this crazy season was I did not want to find myself as somebody stuck on an elevator in between floors. Somebody who's just stuck on elevators and not here nor there. They're just stuck on an elevator. That was one of my biggest fears. And so what I'm wanting us to dive into and really begin to focus on, as we read this scripture, is the significance behind building foundation. We, we have to focus on foundation. Because if you don't pay attention to the foundation, whatever it is that you build can easily collapse. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Go deeper before you go higher. Go deep. Say, go deep. go deep. Then go high. You see, in the scripture, when they talk about a plumb line, the plumb line is something that a master builder would use to measure the foundation and the vertical alignment of the building that they're building. Anytime that in the scripture, the word of God, that the, the, the Bible talks about a master builder, they refer to the plumb line. Say string with the circle ball and the triangle at the bottom. And again, they, they, a master builder would always be referenced with this tool. Not a shovel. Why not a shovel? Think about it. Why not a shovel? Why would the Bible, when it's talking about a master builder, doesn't refer to him having a shovel? Because we can preach that. We can preach a shovel. We can preach somebody who is digging ditches and finding a way out. Amen? Right? Like, we can go hard here. Come on. We can, we can ride on that for a little bit. He'll, he'll, dig, he'll dig you out the way. Right? Or, or perhaps a, a, what you, maybe a hammer. Your master builder is a hammer and can ultimately can destroy anything that's in your way. Right? But when we're referencing a master builder, which is referencing God, right? A master builder leverages and uses this tool that focuses on the foundation. And when the foundation is built, it is something that is invisible, nor is it attractive. There's nothing exciting about the foundation, right? They, they, what, what is exciting about the foundation? It, it is, you, you don't see it. Everyone pays attention to the building. Everyone pays attention to the glasses, the glass in the building. They pay attention to you know, the windows, they pay attention to the architecture. No one pays attention to the foundation. But we have to do some work, y'all. Because I know the significance and importance of going deep before you go high. It is you having to see the dirt. Because if you come to the dirt and you see the dirt, then you're not going to be afraid to get your hands dirty. You're not going to be afraid if you're ever up here and then are perhaps on the way down, right, because you got to, the Bible speaks about being a base and being a bomb, right? So like this happens in life, right? But if you come and came through the dirt with the great foundation, you're not going to be afraid on those lows because you got a foundation. I'm, I'm, no, I'm no longer afraid because I know that I can drum up money. 
-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because the foundation that was built initially, I know that I can drum up money because it is something that I had to put my hands to and get my hands dirty to figure out. Y'all with me? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to build again a, a context to what we're teaching and why we're teaching this thing. Because foundation teaching is key. Zerubbabel was at that time the one who was considered the master builder and him having a plumb line was a sign that great work was about to come to play. In other words, it was a sign to people that now there is a master builder who is about to get down and do some work. That's why the scripture is using that reference. Zerubbabel was the one who was rebuilding the temple. That's what he was rebuilding. At the time, there was the temple of Solomon who was completely destroyed when the Babylonians took it over. So this was a massive moment, a massive time. And so here we're now, Zerubbabel coming to rebuild the temple and what he had in him was a plumb line and that alone go ahead and gave the confidence to everybody knowing that something is about to happen. Amen? You got to have the context. Amen? And so this is what uh, was taking place at the time. And it is for measuring growth, for measuring foundation. I think if you're taking notes, you need to be writing that down. You have to be building a foundation that is measurable. Build a foundation that is measurable. Something that you know you're putting depth into this. Amen? So, I also want to describe and talk about something that's critical here. It says that when you are starting off small, this whole place of despising small beginnings, that it really is just a prelude to the grand finale. Right? So, we're getting the foundation stuff together, but I challenge you to change your perspective regarding small beginnings. Because it is in those small beginnings that God is cultivating talent and gift and skill sets. It is in the small settings that he is building things. See, we may be desperate and are ready for something to change, but could it be that you're not ready for that change yourself? You may be wanting more or bigger, but if that happened, could it be that your foundation has not been fully settled, and if that was put on you, then you would break? That there is a, an importance of you having a secure and strong foundation. That's what the Bible says, build your house upon a rock, right? Because it is sound, it is something strong of strength. Amen, are y'all with me? This okay? So, so when we're building this foundation, we know that God takes his time to build us when we are small, in these smaller times. It's okay to be frustrated. But understand that his ways are not your ways. What he's doing in your life, perhaps you're not fully in agreement with yet, but there is foundational work that's having to happen. And the more you allow yourself to be moldable, the quicker that experience will be. The more that you would allow him to build and work with you down here at these levels is going to help you accelerate to this level. Amen. Right? Every master piece that God has uh, 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 shown us biblically, biblically started off small. The majority of them have. Look at Moses, masterpiece, leader who was able to lead millions of people. He was able to negotiate with the Pharaoh, with the king of that time. He was able to be so successful, but yet his training happened in the back parts of the desert where he was just you know, training up sheep and probably leading gnats and flies. That's the only people he was leading. But he was being trained there. Look at Abraham. Abraham was somebody who was promised to lead nations. You're going to be the father of many nations. Is that right? He'll be the father of many nations. But yet imagine Abraham, 90 plus years old, no children, just sitting there, probably with his head hung low in between his shoulders because he had yet to have a child. 
right? That he that that this birthing of many nations has not happened as of yet. Like what? I'm already older. You know, come on, so it, you that age, certain things stop functioning. Mm -hmm. That you can't necessarily, you know, have a child at that age. Y'all with me? So imagine, imagine that that experience of Abraham. And so he's in this moment to where God is just building foundation and he now is able to do, not only have a child with Sarah, but even after Sarah's death, he was still birthing babies. Come on, y'all. That he was able, that God took him from that place to the next. Look at David. David was prophesied that he would be king of Israel, but yet he was sent back to, to sheep, to, to the sheep and picking up sheep dung. You see what I'm saying? Like I'm, trying to, I'm trying to give you examples of the many times that God's greatest leaders and people started off in a place of humility, of humbleness. Yeah. Right? Because, because what happens is if you don't appreciate that, you're gonna, you're going to, you're gonna, you're gonna come and scoff at it. You're gonna, you're not going to appreciate the small moments to which he's building you. And if you do that, then he's not going to entrust you with more. You see what I'm saying? Like, like you have to be able to recognize and understand that, you know what, God? I know this is not where I want to be, but thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to do this. Yeah. And, give me, and give me the skill set to do this and do this effectively. That's what David was prophesied that he would be king of Israel, but yet he's picking up sheep dung. Imagine that frustration. Look at Joseph. Joseph was somebody who in a dream was promised that he would be reigning over his brothers. That he was going to be ruling over his brothers. And the very next scene, we see Joseph getting beat up by his brothers. And getting tossed into a pit. Imagine the negotiation with depression. Imagine Joseph at the bottom of the pit now, when he was promised this to be reigning over the brothers and the very brothers whom he was supposed to be reigning over now tossed him into a pit. And now here he is. Imagine the laugh of the enemy. Yeah. Imagine how much the devil is laughing at that moment. Yeah. Imagine Joseph just sitting there like, Lord, what in the world? This is not what you told me. This is not. And all I did was but share what you shared with me, and here I am in a pit. How am I, how am I supposed to? And the devil says, laughing. You think you're going to be reigning. You think you're going to be much. You think you're going to be a king. And so the devil is continually murmuring these things and even does so with us in our moments of small as we transition to large. Because he wants you to be captured and get lost in that moment. He wants you to be focusing on them. He wants 